And I hear the Savior say, Thy strength indeed is small, child of weakness, watch and pray, find in me thine all in all. Cause Jesus paid it all, all to him I
Hello and welcome to our online worship and message today here with North County Church of Christ. And I want to welcome those of you that are watching and may not be a part of our church family. We hope one day, uh, if you haven't done so already, you'll have the opportunity to gather with us and worship with us in person and that we'll get the opportunity uh, to get to know you a little bit. You may be watching from another part of the country or some other country altogether. Uh, we welcome everybody that's with us, those in our community and those outside of our community. And hello to those in the North County Church family. We're going to be sharing some stuff out of Matthew chapter 5 in just a couple of moments. Going to read a text from there that is quite well known. Some of you may remember the name Oscar Hammerstein. He tells the story in a book that he wrote entitled Lyrics of a photograph that he saw of the head of the Statue of Liberty that was taken from a photographer up in a helicopter. And as he looked at the hair on the statue, he was amazed by the painstaking work that had been taken, the detail that was given. And he reflected on how the sculptor couldn't have imagined, even in his wildest dreams, that one day there would be a device that would enable somebody to fly up above the head of the statue and take a picture from the top. And yet what impressed him was that this person, this sculptor, had given as much detail and care to that part of the statue as he did the face, the arms, and the legs. So Hammerstein in the book wrote the following. He said, when you're creating a work of art or any other kind of work, finish the job perfectly. You never know when a helicopter or some other instrument not at the moment invented may come along and find you out. We kind of call that in modern terminology going the second mile, giving the second mile to detail. This is a kind of uncommon second mile attention to finer details. This is going to greater lengths than what might be expected of a person or even demanded of a person. And it's really rather rare. You may not know it, but the terminology going the second mile is a term that comes from our Lord Jesus himself. So we're going to read the text out of which we learn about going another mile when we're tempted to just go one. This is the Sermon on the Mount, and there's a context to it. Jesus says in Matthew chapter 5 at verse 38, You have heard that it was said, eye for eye and tooth for for tooth. But I tell you, do not resist an evil person. If anyone slaps you on the right cheek, turn to him the other cheek also. And if anyone wants to sue you and take your shirt, hand over your coat as well. If anyone forces you to go one mile, go with him two miles. There's our phrase. Give to the one who asks you and do not turn away from the one who wants to borrow from you. So here in this particular text of Scripture, Jesus speaks about going a second mile. Instead of just going one, going two. And it's an interesting phrase, especially for those of us who are free people. Jesus said at verse 41, if someone forces you to go one mile. That sounds kind of strange to our ears because we're not accustomed to anyone forcing us to do anything. But those who were listening to Jesus for the very first time in this Sermon on the Mount, they understood his words with crystal clarity. The expression comes from old Persia. And it refers to the authority given by the king to those who were sent to do his bidding. If a courier or a soldier needed assistance in fulfilling the king's mission, he could commandeer any man or horse or wagon with no questions asked whatsoever. Later, the Greeks and the armies of the Romans adopted the practice. So, at the time that Jesus was ministering, 
any Jew could be forced under the weight of law away from his own concerns to help a legionnaire who may or may not have really needed him. In much the same way, we think about Simon, the Cyrene in Matthew chapter 27 at verse 32, who was forced or compelled, the Bible says, to bear the cross of Jesus, to carry his cross. So can you imagine you're out tilling the soil in your field or you're on your way to an important business meeting and you're running a couple of minutes late and along comes some Roman soldier and the Roman soldier lays his pack down at your feet and he looks you square in the eye and says, all right, you carry it for the next mile. Well, the Roman law said, you have to do it. And you can imagine the Jews of Jesus' day were deeply resentful of what to them was a very humiliating law, and they saw it as a symbol of foreign domination. You can imagine, then, their surprise when Jesus, in teaching that up there on the mountainside about what it is to live in the kingdom, to be his disciple, he says, hey, somebody forces you to go one mile, go with them two miles. You can imagine them thinking to themselves, two miles, wait a minute, I shouldn't have to go one mile, and now you're coming along and telling me to go two. Well, as I read the statement of Jesus, one of the things that jumps out at me is just a reminder that we live in a one-mile world, don't we? I mean, ours is a one-mile world. This saying of Jesus is hard on us because like the hearers, who were listening to the Sermon on the Mount in the first century, we live in a world of rights. Our rights, my rights, rights and responsibilities. And we want to know just how far both extend our rights and our responsibilities. And it's a world of of basic criteria and minimum standards. In our one-mile world, our concept of justice is built upon the principle of reciprocity, equitability, and it seeks to ensure that those who violate somebody's rights and deny justice are appropriately punished. So we have this phrase, an eye for an eye. And where does that phrase come from? You may or may not know it, but that's a phrase that comes out of the Bible too. That's a phrase uh, that God uses back in the Old Testament when he speaks about their system of justice. When you read, for example, in the book of Exodus, in Exodus chapter 21, specifically down at verses 22 to 24, God defined for the people there a system of justice that would be equitable, that would keep the rich from exploiting the poor. And you find similar statements to the one that we're going to read in just a moment in other places in the Old Testament, Leviticus chapter 24 and Deuteronomy chapter 19, all stated in God's law to the Israelites. Here in Exodus chapter 21, Moses is addressing the situation that if two men are fighting and one of them hits a pregnant woman and she gives birth to her child prematurely and there's not serious injury, Uh, There's a remedy, and there's a remedy if there is serious injury, and I'm talking here about a legal remedy. If there's not a serious injury, as you read in the text, the offender must be fined whatever the husband's or the woman's husband demands and the court allows. But if there's a serious injury, there in Exodus chapter 21, we find this eye for eye reciprocity. If there is serious injury, Moses said, you were to take life for life, eye for eye, tooth for tooth, hand for hand, foot for foot, burn for burn, wound for wound, bruise for bruise. So that's the law that Moses gave to the Israelites as far as justice. Now, I think we should probably say here that people often took those passages, and sometimes they even do today, as proof text to show that you can take personal revenge when somebody harms you, 
or causes damage to you or to your property. But these passages, when you read them, they never taught a system of personal vengeance. In fact, these passages are written to keep people from taking personal vengeance against somebody that harmed them. Let me tell you what I mean. When it comes to personal revenge, personal revenge is rarely equitable. It's rarely equitable. When we get back at people for the harm they've caused us, it's rarely in proportion to the offense. For example, you're driving down the freeway at night and somebody's tailgating you, and I mean they're right about to come up into your trunk, it feels like. What do you do in a situation like that? Do you quietly and patiently and calmly kind of put your arm out the window and say, pass on by. Here, let me pull over and let you come on ahead of me with a big smile on your face. Well, maybe some of you do that, but there are some of us that don't do that. Our tendency is maybe to hit the brakes, maybe to even hit the brakes hard, and then maybe to let them pass, and then maybe to get right up on them and maybe flash our brights. Worse yet, some of us can remember hearing about a lot of incidents, particularly up in Los Angeles, of road rage. People would get cut off, cut off on the freeway, and people would come up along, and they would shoot the person that had cut them off on the freeway. Out of anger, they would put a bullet into that car, maybe even kill the person. You see, that's what anger does when it's unchecked. When we're angry, we rarely act rationally. And when we're taking revenge, we rarely act rationally. And so our response is hardly ever equal to the offense. Mike Cope, and, and some of what I just shared, uh, comes from his book uh, out of the Sermon on the Mount that he wrote a number of years back. He tells the story in that particular book about a time that he and his wife had just moved to Memphis, Tennessee. And it was their first day they were getting ready. He was getting ready to study in graduate school at Harding Graduate School of Theology. And so there they are at their new apartment complex. Again, it's the first day at the complex. And what happens as he's going out to take some trash out, he's attacked by a dog. And so he starts kicking at the dog to get the dog to back off. Not kicking at its head, but really just kind of kicking at it, not making contact with the dog, trying to scare it away. Well, all of a sudden, this huge man comes barreling out of a truck, pointing his finger at Mike, and he is shouting, you kick my dog again, and I'll blow your head off. Mike said it would take a real stupid person to do that, but this man seemed to have all the credentials. So, he purposefully never crossed that man's path again. But that illustrates the point, doesn't it? That's what tends to happen. Fairness would say, you kick my dog and I'll kick your dog. It certainly doesn't say, you kick my dog and I'll blow your head off. So what Moses does is Moses dictates to the people their law of justice, eye for eye, tooth for tooth, hand for hand. Uh, the person who's caused the damage shouldn't expect less than that. And the person seeking relief shouldn't demand more than that. Today he might say bumper for bumper, fender for fender. The principle being only take from those who've hurt you what is commensurate with the crime or the damage. Keep justice fair. Proportional compensation was the plan and it was really a mean, means of keeping the rich from exploiting the poor and from literally getting away with murder. Such terms of justice were sanctioned by God as a means of restraining the powerful and as a means of getting people to refrain from this tendency to escalate a matter beyond something that is equal to the offense. And not incidentally, these matters weren't to be handled personally. Deuteronomy chapter 19 finds Moses mentioning judges and witnesses in a court of law. So understanding what God said about eye for eye, tooth for tooth, when we hear Jesus preaching in the Sermon on the Mount, 
we're a little bit surprised at his words because he didn't call upon his people, those who would be in his kingdom, to resist this unjust law being forced to carry somebody's pack a mile. Nor did he simply tell them, hey, carry the pack a mile and do it cheerfully. Do the bare minimum. Do what's being demanded of you. No. Jesus comes along and he calls his followers to respond with voluntary submission and to carry the goods of their enemy, of the Roman soldier, not one mile, but a second mile. One mile for Rome and one mile for the Lord. And to those who were citizens of a one-mile world, that doesn't compute very well. That sounds radical. Unless, unless you've noticed that we serve a two-mile Lord, don't we? I mean, we live in a one-mile world, but our Lord came into this world and he demonstrated over and over again what it is to go the second mile. Now, as you read in the Sermon on the Mount, if you haven't noticed, only one of the illustrations that Jesus uses has to do with serving someone and going a second mile. It really gets tough when you see that Jesus applies the second mile principle even more broadly speaking. I mean, here's somebody that comes along and they strike you on the cheek. And what does Jesus say to do? Turn to him the other also. Here's somebody who files a lawsuit demanding your tunic, demanding your cloak, or demanding your tunic. And what does Jesus say? Well, give him your tunic and give him your cloak also. Another person, they ask you for something. Jesus says, well, give it to them without asking questions. Jesus said, go the second mile. Don't just go the first, go the second. But it's mine. Somebody says, hold on, that's my tunic. That's my cloak. He has no right to it. Jesus says, give it to him. Show him or her that your life is about something bigger than clinging to this world and to the things of this world. But hey, Jesus, he insulted me. I shouldn't take that. I shouldn't have to take that. Jesus says, go ahead, take it, and take it again. Show them by your response that you are a citizen of another world, of another kingdom, in which we don't get caught up in back and forths, tit for tat, personal warfare. Hey, I'll take this pack one mile, but I'll do it in protest. Jesus said, take it another mile. Hey, put a smile on your face. Do it for God. That's the point that Jesus is making here. And not only did Jesus say to do that, he did it. This wasn't some theory that he just espoused, just some philosophy where he was above the very things that he was calling his disciples to. No, he did it over and over and over again. Let's just think of a couple of places where he did that. I want you to think about Jesus in the upper room with his disciples in John chapter 13. While they're all gathered there for the last meal, you'll remember whoever had the responsibility, the job of being the foot washer at the door for people walking into that room, coming out of the dirty, dusty streets, of the city of Jerusalem in their sandals, whoever had the job of washing feet was not there. There was no servant at the door. So what did Jesus do? Well, Jesus didn't say, I'm going to go out and find out who the foot washer is and insist that he get here on the job. I mean, it's hard to get help to show up these days, isn't it? I'll find him. I'll get this sorted out, guys. You just wait. Now, he didn't do that. Nor did he get up and say, hey guys, I mean, you know, I am the Lord. I mean, I'll go ahead and do this because none of you are doing it. Uh, I mean, I'll wash the feet. Don't put yourselves out or anything. And, and then walk over and get the basin and the towel. He didn't do that, did he? No, he just seemed to get up, go get the basin. He goes and he gets the towel. And one by one, he starts washing the feet of the disciples. And he doesn't just wash the feet of Peter and James and John and 
Thaddeus and Andrew and Philip and all. He even washes the feet of Judas Iscariot. Now, I want you to think about this for just a moment. Jesus has gone one mile. He's gone two miles. I would suggest to you that he's going three miles because the very one that is going to get up from that table in just a few short moments and go and sell Jesus out for 30 pieces of silver and betray him, that very one, Jesus, washes his feet as well. We live in a one-mile world, but we serve a second-mile Lord. And it's this very Lord, Jesus, who is up on the cross, dying for the sins of mankind. And while he's there, having been tortured, uh, having been nailed to that cross, with people down below shouting their insults, with all the humiliation that he's experienced, all the degrading comments, all of the physical pain. Jesus is up there on the cross, and he doesn't say, I'm going through this, you know, for those who love me. I'm going through this for my disciples. I would never do this for the people that are cursing and spitting and who nailed me to this cross and who tortured me. No, that's not what he did. Jesus hangs suspended on that cross, and in Luke chapter 23 at verse 34, he prays, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. When Peter preaches on the day of Pentecost in Acts chapter 20, or Acts chapter 2, in verse 36 to 38, he said, Therefore, let all the house of Israel know that God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ. And having heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the other apostles, Brothers, what shall we do? And Peter said, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you'll receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Now, when Jesus went to the cross, he didn't just go one mile. He goes that second mile. He didn't just die for those who had already pledged their loyalty and fidelity and faithfulness as imperfect as they were. He didn't just say, I've come to forgive your sins. He came to forgive the sins of the very ones who put him on the cross who tortured him, who humiliated him, and they can be every bit as cleansed and forgiven as those who started with Jesus from the first day. You see, we live in a one-mile world, but we serve a second-mile Jesus who came and went the second mile to bring us to God, and he has set us on a mission to be a second mile people, to not be so wrapped up in this world that we forget that we live in a different kingdom for a different purpose, on a different mission, to try to win people to Jesus and to shine glory on our Father. So, I'm going to close with this. What does it mean then to be a second mile church? What does a second mile church look like? Well, it'll be a church of people who ask, what will glorify our Father? Not what will satisfy the bare minimum standards of religion. It'll be made up of people who will say, I will go, we will go to any lengths to shine the spotlight on our God, to highlight the goodness and the graciousness and the bigness and the fullness of his love and his forgiveness. It's made up of a people who say, what will glorify rather than what will satisfy the bare minimum requirements of faith. God is lifted up in the eyes of the world when his people look so remarkably different. And the thing that will cause God's people to stand out is this principle of the second mile. When you read the Sermon on the Mount, the whole Sermon on the Mount is a study in being people of the second mile. People whose righteousness exceeds that of the Pharisees. Verse 20, it's not about, hey, Moses said this, but Jesus says this. No, it is about a whole different way of looking at the practice of our faith. Whereas the Pharisees lived with a legalistic righteousness that met certain standards 
This faith that Jesus is calling us to is not a faith that looks for a legalistic bare minimum standard, but a faith that asks, what is the spirit behind this command? And how can I honor God with this command and glorify him in it? How can I be the person that God is calling me to be? Not how can I just check certain religious practices off on a list to feel somewhat good and maybe even smug about myself as the Pharisees might have. So Jesus goes through the sermon and he says, I want you to hear it. You've heard one thing, but I'm telling you another. It's not just about not murdering, not killing. That was never the point Moses was making. Certainly he doesn't want you to kill, but it's also about refusing anger that leads to murder. And instead of being angry, it means being willing to be patient and loving and, and even leaning in to listen to people, to try to understand them. As you read this particular text, he says that even when you've got enemies, adversaries, it's about forgiving your enemies just as he forgave his. It's about instead of seeking to get back at them, loving them and praying for them. He says, hey, if you wrong somebody, it's about being willing to make it right and doing more than is required to make it right. And it means that when somebody offends you or comes after you, you don't have to have the last word. If somebody attacks you, don't attack back. If they strike you on the cheek, turn the other cheek. It means saying no to personal revenge and retaliation and leaving some things for God to deal with while we keep showing kindness and praying for our adversaries. On our jobs, it's doing more than we're being asked to do. It's asking the question, what can I do to keep from, or, or not, what can I do to keep from getting fired, but what can I do to go the second mile to help my coworkers and to help the company to succeed in the things I'm here to help them with? In marriage, it's not just about holding your marriage together and refusing divorce because you know you've got these religious laws that force you to stay together. No. It is about refusing to entertain escape with somebody else. It's about refusing to imagine what it would be like to be with someone else, not lusting in your heart for someone else, but instead making a commitment to love and to serve and to stay committed to your spouse. When you read this Sermon on the Mount, it's all about the second mile. And it's at times saying, I, I'm not going to worry about my rights. Jesus isn't saying we forfeit all of our rights when we become a Christian, but there are times when we can lay down our rights to defer to another person. It's a church. It's a church made up of people who say, not how can I meet the minimum requirements, but how can I in my service, how can I in my faithfulness go the second mile so that God is glorified in everything I do? It is a church made up of people who say, I'm in, I'll serve, I will invest myself in this work, I'll invest myself in these people, I'll invest myself in these children, I'll invest myself in these young people, not, hey, let me know if you need something, or hey, let me know if somebody doesn't show up. I'll be happy to step in then. No, people of the second mile say, I am in. I want to be useful to God. And it's going to the gathering, not just to show up, to show your face so that you can say, hey, I went, as if God is somehow honored by that. But it's going asking, how can I go and spur my brothers and sisters on to love and to good works? How can I go to an, with an attitude of ministering instead of being ministered Two, going the second mile refutes everything about the consumerism that has infected American Christianity. So on and on we could go. You can apply the verse without me spinning every possible scenario. But my question in closing is this. Are you ready to go be second mile disciples in a one mile world? Do you want to stand out and show glory or give glory to God? There are a lot of one-mile Christians out there. The question is, will you go the second 
and make the difference for Jesus. This second mile principle, it'll make all the difference in how you live out your faith and in how we as a church will impact the communities around us. So let me encourage you to wake up each day and to ask the question, what does it look like today to go not one, but the second mile? One perhaps to meet the needs of the day, but the second for Jesus to really shine the light on his glory, his goodness, his love, his graciousness, his bigness, his forgiveness, so that others will see and will be drawn to his light. Let's pray together, and then we'll close with a few other words. Father, we, we love you, God. We're so grateful for this teaching of Jesus that calls us, God, to something deeper and higher and more noble so that people will see your goodness. Help us, God, not to be one-milers. Help us to go the second and the third to glorify you. Use our lives, Father, for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, we hope that you've been moved closer to Jesus today. If we can help you to take a step closer to him, maybe all of this is rather new to you, uh, I would welcome you to let us know how we can help you spiritually. Uh, maybe you're like those I mentioned a little bit earlier. Uh, maybe you've been indifferent to Jesus, hostile to Jesus. I want you to know that the reason Jesus died was as much for you as it is for anybody who's listening to this and has already accepted him as Savior and Lord. That same promise of forgiveness, that if you put your faith in Christ and believe on him and repent and are baptized into Christ, your sins can be washed away by the blood of Jesus. You can be given the Holy Spirit. You can be given a new life. It's a gift for you just as much as anybody else. And that's because Jesus went the second mile to bring us to God. So if we can help you, feel free to shoot me a message. You can email me at info at northcountycfc.org. Info at northcountycfc.org. I'd love to hear from you. North County Church, we're going to be at Great Day Park in Escondido at 6 o'clock this evening. I hope you'll plan to be with us. You're welcome if you're watching this and you live in our community and are not a part of our church family. You are always welcome to come and join with us. Bring a mask. Bring your own chair. It's pretty simple. Uh, it's not complicated at all. We sing some songs together. Praise the Lord. Pray to God. I'll bring a message tonight and we'll enjoy some great fellowship socially distanced, of course. You can feel safe in coming. So six o'clock, Great Day Park. I hope to see you there. Have a blessed day.